Hello and welcome to Critical Line Item. My name is Tom Rablick. Thank you for joining me for this particular podcast. One of the most critical relationships the United States and, and other countries have um, is with the countries in the Middle East. And Iran is one of those fascinating nations that has played a, a pivotal role in the way in which uh, America relates to the Middle East <laughs> all the way from uh, the late 1970s right through up until today, to various things, whether it be uh, nuclear weapon, nuclear weapons uh, treaties and uh, other issues. The Sufan Centre, uh, named after the, the famous former FBI agent Tali Sufan, recently issued a report called A Way Forward with Iran Options for Crafting a US Strategy. It's a detailed report looking at where the US relationship with Iran sits. I've got a really, really uh, knowledgeable person talking to me today, Kenneth um, Katzman, who is a... Uh, a in his day job, he's a senior researcher with the Congressional Research Service, but he's contributed to this particular report issued by the Supan Centre in a personal capacity. Kenneth, thank you for joining me to talk about these important issues. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yeah, I mean, I started my career uh, actually at the Central Intelligence Agency in the mid 80s and uh, dealing at that time with the fallout of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which manifested in part as the Iran-Iraq War, which started in 1980 and was still going on uh, when I started my career in Washington in 1985. That was the, really the height of the war between Iran and Iraq. And uh, the United States was backing Iraq against Iran because of the fear of the Islamic Republic and its permutations. So I was at CIA. Then uh, I was in the private sector for a couple of years, uh, 89 to 91. So uh, right after Ayatollah Khomeini died in 1989, I went to the private sector for a couple of years, defense consulting. And then I landed at the Congressional Research Service in 1991, which was the aftermath, right after the uh, Desert Storm War against Saddam Hussein to expel him from Kuwait. Remember, Saddam, uh, we're partly with our help or tacit backing, as you remember, Saddam actually won the Iran-Iraq War. And Iran was very weak at the time. Saddam was very strong. And he was building weapons of mass destruction. And he was feeling his oats, I suppose you could summarize it. And then he invaded Kuwait in 1990, you know, as what I would say, what others would say is was an overreach, you know, hoping to perhaps control the entire Gulf and Gulf oil supplies in so doing. He was very emboldened, maybe because the U.S. would back him against Iran. Maybe he thought the U.S. wouldn't react if he invaded Kuwait. I don't know. But anyway, President George H.W. Bush did react, said this cannot stand. And we had the Desert Storm War against Saddam Hussein. And uh, right after that, uh, I landed at the Congressional Research Service to follow uh, as you may recall, there were weapons inspections going on in Iraq to make sure he didn't have any retained weapons of mass destruction. And uh, there were overflights to protect the Kurds and the Shias in the south. There was an uprising against Saddam after that war that failed. So there was a lot to work on. And of course, I was working on Iran, too. I did a book, my Ph.D. thesis was on the Iran Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran. So I've, I've sort of been, I, I would say, I'd call it present at the creation of the U.S.-Iran, what I call 42 years of animosity. It's been a very difficult relationship. 
it has almost never improved. There were many who doubted that the United States could obtain this nuclear agreement that was obtained in 2015. It was very difficult negotiation. But the United, uh, you know, with, with partners, with pressure from sanctions, Iran agreed to uh, curb its nuclear program. And that was really <clears throat> what's described in the Sufan paper. Sort of the first real breakthrough between the U.S. and Iran. I mean, there'd been some tacit agreements here and there, you know, to stand up the government of Afghanistan after 9-11 and uh, Iraqi governments after the United States invaded Iraq and kicked out Saddam Hussein. Uh, you know, there were some hostage releases, and small deals here and there, but nothing really transformative. So the uh, the uh, 2015 nuclear deal was seen as sort of a a seminal event, which at that point there was a question, you know, okay, we have this nuclear deal. Iran has agreed to some fairly significant concessions. It got a lot of sanctions relief, obviously, but it made a lot of concessions to get those. And there was a question, which way was the relationship going to go? Was this going to be the start of some sort of a new transformative relationship where the U.S. and Iran could even potentially get to a normalized or some sort of a more normalized relationship? Or was this just a one-off transaction where Iran was going to limit its nuclear program and then go on its merry way with various activities in the region and... Uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and basically, uh, you know, challenge the United States in all the ways it's challenged the United States since 1979. And uh, so that was the question when the nuclear deal was reached. And, uh, you know, uh, many were surprised. I would, I would maybe say even I was surprised that that Iran actually did comply with the deal, you know. But if you if you go by the you know, there's obviously everything with Iran is debated. But uh, if you go by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was the arbiter of Iran's compliance, they judged that Iran was complying with the agreement. And so, uh, but uh, you know, because there is this negative history between the U.S. and Iran. That contributed, I'm sure, to the Trump administration's view that the sanctions relief were too generous, was too generous, that Iran hadn't really moderated its behavior anywhere else other than the nuclear program, and that perhaps the United States needed to shift back to a more, more of a pressure strategy on the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we are now. The Biden administration is looking at going back to the nuclear deal. It's an interesting uh, situation um, that, that exists today. Can we go back to 1979 for um, a few moments? Because that was a period, as um, Ali Supan himself notes in the, in the Black Banners, where a whole range of influences came to bear that we would have experienced the full force of later on. Uh, how, uh, given your understanding of Iran uh, and its history, how great an impact did uh, the, the cultural revolution in Iran in 79 have on um, history at the time, have, have on the situation at the time, but also uh, how how has it impacted things going forward? Well, I mean, as I say, I mean, you know, the United States was allied with the Shah of Iran, who was overthrown in that revolution. So <clears throat> this was a big blow. It's hard to underestimate. I mean, to have the Shah, who was an ally, replaced by Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic Revolution, which were avowed opponents of everything the United States stands for was a pretty big blow. And, uh, and you know, as I said, was still feeling it. Um, 
you know, the United States had relied on the Shah to help with Gulf security for many years. And, and that was all blown out of the water after the Shah was replaced by Khomeini. And then we had this new adversary in, yeah. in the heart of the region who was uh, very well, uh, highly populated. Iran is very populous, it's got about 80 million people now. And with the, you know, tr- t- tremendous oil reserve, gas reserves. And, uh, and Iran was now an enemy. So this was, uh, this was a deep, deep psychological blow to U.S. strategy in the Middle East when that happened. Then we, uh, not long after that, we saw the Soviets enter into Afghanistan. We observed for a decade the conflict between Afghanistan and, 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 and the, the Russians, essentially. Right. Um, uh, to, how I mean, you've obviously observed it more closely. I mean, I, I was in what we call secondary college here in Australia when uh, all of that was going on. So I've been, yeah. I, I came back to it. You've watched it more closely. Um, it, it, how did that then shape the, the US uh, attitude towards uh, countries in the region? Well, you know, as I say, we had lost uh, this major ally. Not only that, but, uh, you know, Iran was the font of a new trend in the region, which was Islamism, Islamic fundamentalism, the idea of Islamic government. Uh-huh. And that had, that had permutations beyond Iran. It, uh, you know, obviously, the, Iran, the Iranian revolution spawned the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon. It certainly influenced the formation of an Islamic, Islamist Palestinian movement, Hamas, which went on to do you know, substantial damage inside Israel through terrorist activities. Uh, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan were certainly energized to some extent by the Iranian Revolution too. They were motivated, you know, by Islamic ideology to some extent, some of the Mujahideen parties more than others. And they were fighting the, the Russians there, Soviet Union. Iran Iran itself wasn't that much involved in fighting the Soviet Union, but uh, the Mujahideen were, along with Islamist Arabs, which ultimately became Al-Qaeda. Remember, bin Laden, yep. Zawahiri, the blind sheikh who did the first trade center bombing in 93. These guys were recruiters of Islamist Arabs from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, to fight alongside the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And that ultimately became Al-Qaeda. So Iran, the idea of, you know, Islamist government, Islamic government, this had permutations well beyond the Islamic Republic of Iran. We're still seeing the ripples, aren't we? Because of uh, even recently, we <coughs> have had uh, evidence of you know, Iran-backed militias attacking U.S. bases in the Middle East. Uh, but to what extent, over several decades, has the Iran um, been uh, that state sponsor, if you like, of, of terrorism in the area? That's been said, but. How would you characterize uh, the, their involvement in that space? Well, I would recommend actually another Sufan product that I contributed to. It's called Iran's Playbook, <laughs> Deconstructing Tehran's Regional Strategy, which I was a extensive contributor to, uh, That which lays out Iran's regional strategy. And I, I, I personally, in my work, try to steer away from the model of supporting terrorism. Now, obviously, a lot of the groups Iran supports have committed acts of terrorism, do commit acts of terrorism. That's true. I wouldn't dispute that. But if you look at the sweep of what Iran is doing, what it's doing is it's cultivating, it's it's forming, helping form militias throughout the region and then nurturing them into larger movements with political power in Lebanon, Iraq, trying the same strategy in Yemen right now with the Houthis. 
Yeah. It's, and, and, and what they're trying to do is develop so many different avenues to attack their enemies and hold countervailing power against their enemies, such as Israel, such as Saudi Arabia. It's really, it's really more of a defense strategy. So I think to say that it's supporting terrorism, th- there's truth to it, but that really doesn't capture what Iran is really trying to do. You know, they're, they're, it's a very, what I would say, a sophisticated and intricate strategy that Iran has in the region. Okay, I, I think it, I get what you're outlining, if, if we can explore this for a moment is any uh, involvement or any activity that involves um, organisations that might be seen as being terrorist groups um, Mm -hmm. is a subset of a broader strategic objective. So it's not just just a, uh, uh, shall we say, a a (coughs) state-sponsored terrorism as a as a tool to deal with certain things. Right. I mean, when I, when I refer to it in my work, uh, you know, when I give speeches, when I, when I'm on panels, I refer to it as Iran's support for armed factions. I, I don't specifically refer to it as Iranian support for terrorism. You know, okay. I refer to it as Iran's support for armed factions in the region, which I think better captures what Iran is up to is it i'm interested by the, the use of uh, the term armed factions is that also because terrorism itself is a tactic rather than um uh, rather than uh, necessarily the best way to describe a group of people doing stuff well you know th- these are these are com- you know uh, people have looked at this you know i think this whole concept of terrorism more extensively than I have, uh, including Ali Sufan, I'm sure. But uh, obviously, <laughs> obviously, he's looked at it more thoroughly than I have. But I mean, let, let's look at Hezbollah. I mean, you know, Hezbollah was committing acts of terrorism, I would say, early in its career and, and even, you know, but 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 w- what we've seen over the past, I'd say, six or seven years is that They've really gotten away from what we would call classic terrorism. It's more of there is armed action against Israel, but even more so there's exercise of political power in Lebanon. So to describe Hezbollah just as a terrorism movement or a terrorist group, you know, that that might have characterized Hezbollah, you know, early in its career. But I think it it doesn't explain the totality of what Hezbollah is now. Hezbollah is a political movement. It's a political power inside Lebanon itself. Yes, it still has an armed faction. Yes, they still may be looking for opportunities and maybe even carrying out some acts of terrorism against Israelis around the world, yes. But primarily, it's seeking now to, I would say, exercise political power in Lebanon and shape events and decisions inside Lebanon itself, often to Iran's advantage. Okay. Yeah. The and the other thing that fascinates me, we've got commentators in Australia who've looked at uh, um, the Trump administration and they spend a fair bit of time analysing the Trump administration. Certainly people who are um, similar to Fox commentators over in the US who uh, have a particular loyalty towards uh, towards Donald Trump in their analysis. And one of the things that keeps coming up, and it, it concerns me, and I want to test whether you share the same concern, is that the minute Joe Biden responded earlier uh, this year to... Um, uh, provocations from or what I would call provocations from the uh, Iranian ba- Iranian backed militias. It was automatically characterised by some people as Joe Biden being more violent than uh, 
than Donald Trump or being more more of a warmonger than Donald Trump. In fact, the Iranians were responding to something that Trump did back in the early 2020 when General Soleimani was was taken out in in that attack. Am I reading it correctly? Well, you know, in my work, given my situation, I never discuss, you know, U.S. politics or U.S. political debates. That's just not what I get into. But I would say in terms of what you're asking, we've seen, yes, I mean, the supporting Iranian, uh, Iraqi armed factions is a policy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. No question. They are seeking to influence Iraqi politics, including trying to drive the United States troops out of Iraq by supporting armed factions in Iraq. Several Iran-backed Shia militias uh, are supported by Iran. There's no question. And as part of Iran's effort to exert influence, And as part of Iran's effort to push back on uh, President Trump's policy of economically pressuring Iran, Iran supported attacks on American forces uh, in Iraq, who were at various Iraqi bases in Iraq. And then at some some on some points, when particularly when service people were killed, Mr. Trump responded. And then Iran responded again, and there was escalation and tit for tat. And then President Trump uh, felt that uh, the instigator of this activity was IRGC Q, uh, Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani. There was a decision to strike him. He was struck. Iran retaliated with missiles. And we are still seeing the permutations. Iran is continuing to support attacks on American forces in Iraq. President Biden decided to respond to one of them, which killed the same red line. When somebody dies, the U.S. has responded. So somebody died in an Iran-backed attack, and President Biden responded. Now, what was interesting, he didn't respond in Iraq. He responded actually against Iraqi militia locations in Syria which was interesting, and we could talk about that. But that there, there was a response, yes. Is there, uh, if, we, if we look at the, the nature of those <clears throat> tactics, Ken, I mean, um, why, would, why would there be a, uh, why would that kind of missile attack be, be significant and be strategically uh, thought as it's important enough by by a U.S. president? Well, I think the issue is, you know, I think, you know, for both the Trump administration and the Biden administration now, the decision has been if an Iran-backed attack kills a service person, even a contractor, it doesn't even have to have to be a military person, if there is death resulting and you don't and the United States doesn't respond, then Iran will keep escalating. So I think there was a decision. <clears throat> There's been a decision for the past several years that uh, the United States will respond as a deterrent. Now, it hasn't been fully successful, you know, because even after President Biden made this strike in Syria that I just mentioned, the Iran-backed militias came right back at it and did another attack. And and they didn't kill anybody, but somebody died actually of a heart attack while he was sheltering. So that's a little little less direct of a connection. But there was a death, not due to the rocket per se, but a death nonetheless in the course of the the clash. And so, uh, you know, the deterrent effect of uh, U.S. strikes against these militias has till now been pretty minimal. So what I would say is the, the, the way to curb this activity in Iraq is to, is to empower the Iraqi government to ex- ex- exercise state power so that these Iran-backed militias can't operate independently anymore. 
But even that is very difficult to uh, achieve because Iran has successfully nurtured these factions into political movements, which is their playbook. That's what they do. And a lot of these militia commanders are now in the parliament. They are big kingmakers. These, these are big, important politicians with big constituencies. So it's hard for the Iraqi government to exercise state power to curb the militias because they are now such powerful actors in their own right. I'm very conscious of the time, Ken, and I really do appreciate you for joining me for, for this particular recording. Um, there are uh, there are a multitude of issues in the Middle East, and particularly with Iran. Um, what are the key What are the key strategic takeaways that that people need to think about when they when they reflect on yeah, the Middle East, Iran specifically, and how it engages with the West. What are the what are the most key issues in your mind? Well, you know, a lot of my current, my most recent work uh, outside uh, outside work with think tanks, etc., has focused more on. What is Iran looking for? What would get Iran to the table in terms of uh, ending or curbing its support for these armed factions all over the region? And I'm, <clears throat> a lot of what I'm writing about these days is to talk about, you know, the need for conflict resolution in each of the different conflicts where Iran is involved, uh, pressuring Iran with sanctions did not cause Iran to withdraw from Syria, did not cause Iran to stop supporting Hezbollah, did not cause Iran to stop supporting the Houthis, did not cause Iran to stop supporting the Iraqi militias. So the sanctions had very limited, have had very limited effect in accomplishing that. But, and Iran is not really willing to talk about unilateral curbs in, let's say, a, a new or expanded nuclear deal. Because Iran's view is, look, everybody's interfering in these conflicts. We are not going to be unilateral. We cannot interfere, and everybody else is still allowed to interfere. So Iran will not discuss that diplomatically. So the issue I'm writing about recently, or trying to at least, is uh, what are the what what are the ways to resolve the various conflicts that Iran is involved in, such as Syria, such as Yemen? Because Iran will, as Iran will come to discussions about a multilateral solution for these various places, these various conflicts. They they are willing to discuss, you know, solutions that if the conflicts end, then Iran will stop interfering. <clears throat> yes, but does that discussion then? Uh, I mean, we can it, people can come to the table, but does the is the the, the determinant about uh, whether Iran um, has a, a proceeds positively in any sort of international dialogue? Um, a uh, it, uh, an, administra an administration in the country in question or country in question that that they favour politically, because it would seem to me that they would be more inclined to back a solution in various jurisdictions that is is Islamist in nature. Well, of course they of course they are going to bargain hard for their their choices. Absolutely, they are they are going to bargain very hard for their choices, but there are. There are times when Iran is willing to compromise. I mean, they did. Let's look at Iraq. You know, they, they have accepted the appointment of various prime ministers who were not their first choice. Um, okay. Haider al-Abadi was not their first choice. They accepted it. The U.S. and Iran came to an agreement on him. The U.S. and agreement came to an agreement on Mr. Maliki uh, originally. The, uh, they accepted the appointment of uh, the current prime minister, al-Qadami, even though he was clearly not their first choice. 
So they do, you know, yes, they have their demands, they have their bottom lines, but they do, <clears throat> they can, there are formulas that they can come to accept in my, in my judgment. Okay. Now you've done an extensive amount of work on the Middle East and Iran, Iraq over the years. Uh, where can people find the material that you've uh, written if they if they get more interested and they want to track things down? Well, obviously the Sufan Center, uh, you know, is uh, an excellent source these days. <clears throat> <clears throat> contributed to the two reports that I mentioned, the Iran Playbook Report and the uh, Iran Way Forward Report that just came out uh, yep. a month ago. Um, you know, <clears throat> I write, uh, I've done some writing for the Atlanta Council, the, the Gulf International Forum, the uh, Arab Center DC, uh, the Arab Gulf State Institute of Washington, uh, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm doing some writing with various think tanks, but my work for the Congress, obviously, it's uh, we don't uh, we don't circulate it necessarily among the public, but uh, there is a public website, but uh, we we don't promote, uh, you know, we we work uh, in my official duties. I work for the U.S. Congress, and that's that's they're the main consumer of my work there. That's important work, which um, you've been doing since the early 90s, and, and hopefully they continue to get the benefit of your expertise in in um, the years to come. Uh, Kenneth Casford, thank you for joining me for this particular podcast. Thank you, Tom. Thank and, you. And, and, and that's been uh, a, an excellent insight into the Middle East and Iran particularly. So thanks for that. <laughs>